Is that on? Can you hear me? You good? Okay. Well, first, let me thank the organizers for inviting me. I'll say on a on a technical note, I had some external animations I'm not going to be able to play, but uh, that's probably a good thing because I had too many slides anyway. So I have other animations that are embedded that should work. No, no, no. It's my fault. <laughs> I might just use the. Thanks. Um, let's see. I guess I can't see it on here, so I'll put the screen. So um, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, modeling Earth surface flow hazards with DCLOF, which is uh, the software we've developed. Um, so to give a little background of where the software comes from, it, it, the work I'm going to describe in this talk is really a synthesis of, of two lines of research that have been developed over, over decades, uh, the first being development of numerical software, um, uh, which is uh, folks here, and I think most of them are here today. And then the other line of research that this is a synthesis of is the development of, of physical and mathematical models for landslides and debris flows. And that's uh, work that's been done primarily with uh, Dick Iverson of USGS, who I work closely with, and also uh, uh, debris flow flume crews, who some, some people here have worked with. Uh, so just briefly, the software, uh, to give the phylogeny, I guess, uh, so clock pack is a is a soft open source software package that was developed by uh, randy levesque and others um, uh, which is for modeling gen general hyperbolic systems or wave propagation problems uh, we then created geoclaw which is a subset or extension of clock pack uh, which is devoted to uh, tsunamis and, and wave propagation problems and originally we called it tsunami claw but then we realized it had features that were useful for other uh, free surface flow problems um, and then dclaw is uh, uh, the software that's specifically aimed at, at granular fluid flows or, or landslides and debris flows. Um, <clears throat> now, the, uh, historically, um, in the 1980s, that was that really spurred the interest in being able to model debris flows for hazard assessment. Um, these events here really increased the interest in it. Um, uh, but um, in developing the model, I, I'm going to use the terms debris flows and landslides fairly generally interchangeably. Um, people in the geology community sometimes have a, a very specific nomenclature for different types of, of landslides and so forth, but I'll, I'll use the terms uh, sort of generally. Um, so we're talking about saturated granular fluid mixtures. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly give a, a model summary. Uh, but obviously, I don't have time to go into the gory details, but it's described in, in these papers here. Uh, but this is a depth average uh, flow model. Um, it's, it's two phase, so we're, we're modeling solid fluid mixtures, and there's a pore pressure evolution which affects the resistance or the mobility of the flow. Uh, so our, our variables that we solve for are the depth, velocities, the solid or fluid volume fractions, and then the pore fluid pressure. Um, and the, 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 the feedback between the solid volume fraction and the pore fluid pressure is really uh, one of the unique features of this model. So our motivation was to be able to simulate um, landslides from the initiation process all the way to the deposition. Uh, so, so simple early models often use uh, fluid models with some sort of elaborate single fixed rheology. But however, those, those have a difficult time capturing this transition uh, uh, from a stable mass on the side of a hill slope to a highly mobile uh, debris flow. So if you think of a, a sediment mass on a, on, a, on a slope, there's a force balance. When that force balance is perturbed, the driving forces overcome the resistive forces, it then fails. So that's in the realm of slope stability, but it really doesn't tell you anything about the fate of that flow. It could slump and stabilize, or it could evolve into a high speed, highly mobile flow. So we want to be able to model that fate just given this initial uh, force perturbation. And so the basis of being able to do that is, is this co evolution of the pore fluid pressure and the solid volume fraction. So if the, the pore fluid pressure increases, that reduces the, the effective stress or the resistance of the flow, and then that um, leads to a mobile flow. If the pore fluid pressure decreases, that stabilizes the flow due to higher resistance. Um, so to, to 
to model this, we use the concept of dilatancy, and that's that's what allows us to couple this evolution of solid volume fraction and pore fluid pressure. Um, and it's based on if 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 we have a fairly loose granular mixture and it begins to shear, it contracts, drives up the pore fluid pressure, drives down the resistance, becomes highly mobile. Conversely, if you have fairly dense material, it shears, it dilates, drives down the pore fluid pressure and increases the resistance and it can stabilize. Um, so in, in developing this model, it was in, important to, uh, or one of the, the features or, or uh, facilities that allowed the development of this physical model is the, the USGS debris flow fluid, which was built in the 90s. Um, it's this 90 meter channel that's heavily instrumented and it's in a measure things like the evolving depth, pore fluid pressure, shear stresses, and so forth, allowing us to develop that, that physical model. Um, I, I can't play the movie, but uh, we have different types of experiments we do here. We load the uh, hopper up with sediment, saturate it, open the gate doors, measure what happens. Um, and then we can then, okay, we can then simulate that to validate the model. So um, it's an important, important uh, validation tool. But uh, more importantly, um, it, it, like I said, it allows us to develop the physical model. Um, a, a different type of experiment that's done here are, are what we call these natural release experiments. And in this case, there, there aren't gate doors. Uh, Hopper is loaded with sediment that's dry, um, and then it's slowly saturated. And then eventually the pore fluid pressure increases to the point where the driving forces overcome the resistive forces and it fails naturally. Um, so here's a, a simulation of this, one of these experiments. Um, uh, so you'll see here, as I play this animation, it goes really quickly. You'll see a blue line increasing. That represents the, the pore fluid pressure. It'll reach a certain point. It'll hit that threshold where there's failure. It then begins to flow, and the flow will then quickly uh, liquefy and become uh, highly mobile. This would be more compelling if I could play the video of the experiment. Um, that's okay. I don't have time anyway. Uh, now we we do essentially the exact same experiments, but Compact the soil more. Um, so these are essentially repeated experiments, like the highly mobile one, but with dense soil. I won't go into these quantities here, but but uh, um, the initial porosity is slightly higher here. It's a denser material, um, and in this case, I won't play an animation because you can't really see anything happen. Um, but we rise, we, we manually raise the pore fluid pressure like before. At this point, which I've called time equals zero, it's actually reached that threshold, and this material has actually failed and started to slump. But as you can see, 60 seconds later, um, nothing really has happened. It's stabilized. Um, so these are then comparisons of these the loose soil experiments and the dense soil experiments, showing the, the evolution of the pressure, uh, comparing experiment and simulation. And you can see it becomes mobile as it moves uh, down slope. In the dense soil case, if you look at the time scale here, this is 100 seconds or so. The flow is only moving less than a meter or so, and the pore pressure is slowly decreasing. Um, Okay, so uh, moving on to some applications, we, we uh, most recently have been looking at, at flows which involve um, the interaction of these debris flow, granular fluid materials with bodies of water. Because the e equations are two-phase, so we have evolving volume fractions. Uh, that means if, if we uh, initialize with zero solids, um, the equations actually reduce to the shallow water equations, which are what we use for tsunami modeling. Um, and you can have volume fractions intermediate to, to a, a debris flow and a, a, a pure water and use single simulations to um, seamless simulations to uh, you know, model those events. Um, right, so, so we've been looking at these sometimes called cascading flow hazards uh, where you have these interactions. Um, so some examples are you, you might have tsunami inundation, which entrains debris as it inundates shorelines, that essentially becomes like a debris flow at the front. Um, landslide generated tsunamis are another example. Landslide impacts pure water, generates the tsunami. Uh, some other examples are, are, say, the formation of a natural dam. A landslide might dam a drainage, you might have a lake built behind it, then you might have a dam breach and failure, flash flood that can entrain debris downstream and become a debris flow. Um, uh, so I think I'm going to skip this. I'm going to skip this application. Uh, this is the first first application we looked at in, in, in simulating these, these uh, interacting flows, but it's all external animation. So I think I'll move on to the next example. 
Um, so we've been we've been looking at this this problem of a, a, a glacial lake outburst flood in in Oregon. Um, there's a, a moraine dam lake, Carver Lake, on South Sisters volcano, which could potentially uh, could potentially be an outburst flood, and it could result in flooding in the, the town of Sisters down here uh, at the bottom of the slide, which is about 20 kilometers away. Um, we the this came to our attention because there was a study in the in the 1980s. So here's sort of zooming in on this, this Carver Lake, which has a moraine dam here and the South Sisters here. Um, in the 1980s, the USGS and some other groups did some studies and brought this to the attention of the community. And it was a, a somewhat of a kind of an alarmist approach in some ways that the, the community became very aware of it and, and uh, heightened awareness to the point where they were thinking that this could be an imminent disaster, that this marine dam could fail um, at any, any time. Um, <clears throat> so backing up a little bit to show the domain here. So this, this box here is the same area as this slide here. You can sort of make out Carver Lake here and the uh, peak of Sisters. And then about 20 kilometers downstream, this box here is this here where you can see the community of Sisters. So it's a fairly large domain. And it doesn't really, you know, first glance, it doesn't really seem like this small lake here poses much of a threat to the community. And so the, the community has been aware of, of this previous study for a while and they, they want to revisit it. Um, this is the original study from the 80s, which shows the potential flooding in Sisters. This is the Whitechess Creek drainage, which goes through town. You, it's hard to make out, but this, this black line here is what they predicted might be the flood extent from a Carver Lake outburst flood. Um, and it, it goes right through the middle of town. So um, it's actually, a fairly significant hazard based on this this study. Um, now, looking at the the, the lake here, uh, some I'm not a, a geotechnical engineer, but various groups have gone up there, and it doesn't really seem like this is the Moraine Dam here. It doesn't really seem like it uh, has much potential to just spontaneously fail based on rising lake levels. Uh, so, we've uh, we think really the only thing that could cause a, a lake outburst flood here is a, is a large landslide into the lake, which would cause overtopping waves over the dam. Then that could cause the, the, the dam breaching process um, to move forward. Um, and so what we've decided to do is, is just to model that basically. Um, if, that's, if, if that's really the, well, the light, most likely cause of a dam breach, uh, we might as well model that, that worst case scenario. So what we did is we, we just simulated a, a up with the volume of landslide here up above the lake which would be large enough to um, uh, drain the lake essentially so we're not predicting or suggesting that this is a, a likely landslide we didn't identify a slope and say hey this looks like it's going to fail we just said well if, if you want to look at the worst case scenario then that's what we try to model so so we we initialized the model with a solid fluid mixture for the landslide and the lake with pure water and basically let it go um, this is a 5 million cubic meter landslide, which, which is fairly large for South Sisters, but not unprecedented for Cascade volcanoes. Um, it would be quite small on, on a larger volcano like Mount Rainier. So you can see the, the slide come down, hits the lake, generates these waves, and then as these waves overtop the dam, we allow entrainment of that solid material and the, the dam breaching process to occur. Um, it's the, the physics of, of, of this entrainment process are not well constrained so we basically have a, a model where we can just turn a knob and get the entrainment rate um, that we want it's not well physically constrained but just to just to, just trying to drain the lake basically and come up with the worst case scenario so here's another another view of the same simulation and you can see downstream of the dam it's essentially a debris flow the colors here are the solid volume fraction so you can think of this brown as a debris flow and dilute flows uh, below that. But it's essentially a debris flow below the lake and eventually the entire lake drains. We've simulated different landslides with different mobilities to come up with a range of possibilities. Uh, so this, this shows the domain of the simulation and you can see it's quite large. If, if you look in this box here, you can probably barely make out Carver Lake here and the landslide here. Community of Sisters is down here. We use, in our codes, we use adaptive mesh refinement to track the flood so we can resol resolve the, the moving flood or debris flow on, on uh, grids of enough resolution, but not have to waste computational um, uh, cost 
for areas where nothing's happening. So we have coarse grids where nothing's happening and, and fine grids tracking the flow. Now the result we got was, was quite different than the original study in the 80s. So in the 80s, they used 1D modeling and they had to assume uh, that they made this, this, but they could only track essentially the flood going down the main channel of Whitejust Creek. But you can see our results here, there's a bifurcation of the flood as it, it uh, hits this alluvial fan um, near Sisters. So upstream of, of, of this in Whitejust Creek, it's a fairly steep channelized canyon. Uh, the flow comes down there and then, and then hits this flat plain and bifurcates. And so when this first happened, it was so different than what was expected. We thought we better go out and look in the field and see if this seems reasonable. So we drove out and, and this is a, a map of Whitejust Creek here. The, the, the canyon is, is sort of down here. It's right upstream of this. And the alluvial fan starts about here, which is right about here in this slide, this frame. Um, it's hard to make out, but this cross section here shows the uh, elevation of the, the banks of the, the channel. And it's very low when you get there. It, it's not surprising that this flood would, would uh, leave the channel and, and spread out over this, this fan. This transect here, it, it's, shows the channel's about a meter high. Over here is where the road is near, near the channel. It's actually lower than the water level in the, in the channel. Um, so we think this is a reasonable expectation of what would happen in the case of a flood. This, it's hard to make out the, the scales here, but, but uh, um, this looks pretty devastating. But if you, if you take a closer look at the scales here, it's actually quite shallow and it seems more like a flooding nuisance than a real um, hazard in terms of, of lives and so forth. Uh, and again, this, this was our worst case scenario. Um, so, so moving on to another application, these are somewhat, you know, this is much uh, bigger uh, potential events. So we're looking at potential lahars off of Mount Rainier, um, particularly coming from the, the west side of Mount Rainier uh, that could flood the Puyallup River Basin or the Nisqually River. Uh, mo most, most focus on these Mount Rainier lahars has been on the Puyallup River drainage. In particular, this community of Ording downstream here is, is uh, um, quite aware of the potential of lahars, and they're very proactive in terms of they have uh, sirens and they, they uh, uh, that would be triggered if, if there, there are uh, early warning triggers up in the channels of the Puyallup that would be triggered by a lahar. That sets off alarms in Ording. They, they uh, do drills every month where uh, essentially people leave the town. So the, the town here is, is built on hard deposits and it's it's uh, sandwiched in between the, the carbon and Puyallup River so they're, they're right in the path of the flood and their their uh, evacuation strategy is basically to walk across you know the bridges to leave this floodplain um, the, the, all of the schools are located in this floodplain here um, now that the the, uh, uh, the knowledge of these lahars uh, a lot of it comes from this early study where they've identified uh, old lahars deposits from what's known as the electron mud flow. So this was a, a so-called unheralded lahar that occurred without, it was not during eruptive activity. It was uh, just a landslide essentially in the Sunset Amphitheater, uh, about 260 million cubic meters um, and uh, inundated this map here. So we focused on potential lahars of that size because we're looking at, we want to look at unheralded events that wouldn't have eruptive activity. Um, or precursory activity that would give an indication. Though those could be much larger, but but really these could happen spontaneously. So that's what we want to look at in terms of potential hazard. Um, we've identified two source areas, uh, uh, all on the west side of Rainier. But one is the Sun Saint Amphitheater here, which is sort of known as okay, this is the most likely source of the large landslide. Uh, but based on slope stability studies uh, done by Mark Reed, there's also an area. Uh, south of, of Sunset Amphitheater here. It's uh, the least stable zone. So we've, we've looked at those two regions of sources. So this, this here shows the further north source um, from the Sunset Amphitheater. Um, when we construct our, our landslide failure volume, essentially we just look at a map view of what seems like a potential likely failure uh, area. And then we construct a basal slip surface uh, to give us essentially the volume we want. Um, that basal slip surface becomes a continuous surface, and then we just initialize the granular fluid material, slowly rise the pore pressure until it fails, and then let it go. So when, when we do this, rising the pore pressure, we manu manually raise it until failure commences at some point. 
And then once that occurs, we let the model equations evolve on their, on their own. We've done different landslides with different mobilities. This is one that's not particularly mobile. You can see a lot of material remains up here in the source area. Um, this is a map view of the same simulation. You can see flow goes down this Puyallup River. This is the community, the floodplain that Ording is built on. And you can see it takes about an hour to get there. Now, the, the community of Ording's very interested in the timing because they, they design these evacuation strategies and they, they take roughly 40 to 50 minutes uh, um, to get everyone evacuated from that floodplain. It, it takes about an hour to reach there. So it's, there's not much time to, to buy. So they're, they're very interested in the timing, but of course, you can't say exactly how long it will take because different simulations with different mobilities give different arrival times. Don't think I can play that. Um, so this is the other source area we've looked at. Um, same volume landslide. Um, now this one flows mostly down the Nisqually drainage, which is a drainage that really hasn't um, the Lahars down that drainage really haven't been looked at as much. Um, <clears throat> here's a, a top view of that simulation. You can see it also bifurcates and goes down the Puyallup drainage. It also goes down this Nisqually drainage to the south here. Now, another issue has come up with this, these Nisqually drainage lahars, and that's that there's a, a lake down here, Alder Lake, which is actually a reservoir. There's a, a dam here at, uh, down at the downstream side. So the, the dam operators are, are interested in this. What, you know, potentially a lahar could inundate the lake, rise the lake level, overtop the dam, um, and cause a flood downstream of the dam. But they're also concerned about, you know, if you're increasing the density of the lake with the lahar material, could that potentially compromise the dam? That's a question, of course, we can't answer, but, but we can simulate the, the Lahar entering the lake. Here's a, um, some photos of Alder Lake Dam. You see Rainier in the background here. It's actually a, about a 100 meter dam. It's much more impressive. Uh, we drove up and saw this, and it was much larger than I had sort of imagined when we first modeled this. Um, so here's an oblique view of the same simulation. You can see the Lahar coming down the drainage here. interacts with the lake, sort of a mixing region in the, in the front. Here's a map view of the same simulation. This, this shows the, the volume fraction, fractions mixing. Um, and the, the waves from this have already uh, caused overtopping at the dam. You see the solid material, but of course there's water waves in front of that. Uh, we, we thought that, that it might actually create a fairly large tsunami, like some landslide tsunami we've modeled, but because the lake's fairly shallow here at the upstream side, it mostly just rises the lake level. So here's the same animation showing the water level rising, and then eventually overtops the dam. Now it turns out this is actually another reservoir downstream of the dam. It's the, the original reservoir, it's a smaller dam downstream. And we're currently looking at, you know, how, how high could that reservoir raise and then could that overtop that, that downstream dam. Uh, so that, that's all the applications I'll show. Um, and uh, just kind of point out some of the future directions we're looking at. We, we want to improve these models for entrainment, um, more physically based models, uh, uh, maybe include sediment true sediment transport deposition, deposition by settling. So in the Lahar model, it can deposit simply from the material stopping, becoming less mobile. Um, uh, we're also looking at more distributed source debris flows. So the debris flows we model are based on these single source landslides, which fail and become debris flows. But one can also have debris flows that actually begin as, as rainfall runoff or a flood, which are entraining debris and eventually entrain enough debris as they, they flow downstream that they become debris flows. Those, those are a different initiation process that we're looking at where we would uh, drape material over a landscape and have some model for the, the core pressure increase based on rainfall or some other model. Um, and then eventually we want to develop the same idea of multi-phase, two-phase models, but have multi-layers. So this would be more appropriate for modeling things like submarine landslide generated tsunamis where you really need, um, you can't, you really shouldn't have a, a single volume fraction through a depth in one region. You'd want maybe a more dense material underlying more fluid material, but then also have mass exchange and momentum exchange between those layers. So those are the directions we're going in and uh, 
that, I'll thank you and look for any questions. Are there questions for David? Uh, so can these be used for areas where there's ice in the landslide, essentially? Um, I think that's, yeah, um, well, certainly the ice can contribute to water entrainment. Um, these are developed more for, for true solids. Um, how applicable it is to a, to a landslide which has ice, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, it wasn't developed for that, but uh, the ice might, you know, it has some properties similar to solids. Um, so it can be used for it. Is it as good for that? Not quite sure. Um, I don't think it's particularly Earth centric. We've modeled landslides on Mars. I mean, it changed the gravity and, and no, no water. Um, well, Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't think I, I don't see anything Earth centric about this, but I think it could be applied to that. I, I just thank you. It was really great, um, great stuff. And Thanks. I just had a quick question on your last case study. You showed um, the debris flow approaching the dam and then dam overtopping. Yeah. Have you done any dam breaching or dam breaking or failure? Um, well, we're. I mean, we're. That's kind of be outside of our expertise, studying the, the structural integrity of the dam. Um, but I think this this type of model could be used as an input for geotechnical engineers um, that, that could look at that. But we we haven't. So impressive simulation. Since you brought up the entrainment question, what fraction of the hazards that you just showed us is due to? material they're picking up along the way and how are you treating this right now? How much does it matter if this is a dry gravel bedded valley versus right. wet and so forth? What's, how's, what's the sensitivity look like? Um, well, so in these cases, it, it actually plays a pretty big role. And I mean, mostly for a few reasons. One, just increasing the volume. You know, we, we of course, like I said, I wasn't real physically constrained about how much volume we're in training. We, we try to look at worst case scenarios, um, but Simulations that just empty the lake and don't entrain any any volume are quite a bit less less inundation downstream in Sisters, for example, in that in, in that example. Um, so I think entrainment plays a big role in, in the size of the hazard. Also, entrainment can uh, significantly increase the mobility of the flow, which is somewhat counterintuitive. But if the material is saturated, that's a, that it's entraining, that can lead to more mobility through rising pore pressures. In fact, we've done. Quite a few experiments at the flume where we have two debris flows one that in, hits a bed with the entrains material and becomes much much more mobile um, so yeah i think it plays a big role and that's one reason we like to better have better physical models for that entrainment process okay we should move on but let's uh let's thank david one more time thanks